But can you start by telling us your name and where you were born? Certainly. Well, today's Friday the 10th of September, isn't it? 1993, and Peter's interviewing me. I'm not much good at it, but nevertheless. Uh, yes, well, I suppose I started... Uh, lighthouse keeping through a very peculiar set of circumstances. I'll come to that in a minute, but I was born in Shorncliffe, Kent, 1927, the son of a serving soldier. So I've been in the army all uh, a lot of my juvenile life, and uh, I went in the army and came out, decided to get a job uh, then living at Rill in North Wales and if you've ever been to a seaside town in the middle of winter you'll know what I mean, no work, no money. Decided to come down to Birmingham and got a job driving buses. After a couple of years of this I was that brassed off with all the stopping and starting and I sat in the middle of a traffic jam one day in the middle of Birmingham and I thought well What's the exact opposite to this? Lighthouse keeping, I thought, yeah, that's not bad. So I wrote to the old codgers in the Daily Mirror and eventually went for an interview at the Hollyhead Depot in Anglesey, uh, medical, and uh, assessed for uh, writing and simple arithmetic eventually joined and uh, finally finished up in London uh, living in digs at the Missions to Seamen Hotel Salmon Lane Stepney eventually went to Blackwall Depot for training um, the first lighthouse I actually went to was the Chapman in the Thames estuary just off Canvey Island. I was there for a month and came back to Blackwall workshops for more training uh, and went back to the Chapman for the second time. The Chapman was an interesting lighthouse it was one of the old iron pile type uh, just crewed by two uh, low tide you could actually walk ashore to the island and get fresh stores from the azonia stores and i'm looking at my log book here little scrapbook i've kept from June 1949 and I see that uh, it was the 14th of June 1949 to the 26th of July and the 3rd of August to the 30th of August and I was on with uh, an assistant keeper called Bill Christie got a couple of photographs here a good one showing the small lighthouse and another one standing at the bottom on the platform waiting for the launch to come alongside to transfer stores etc. Um, as far as I know there were two similar construction uh, to the Chapman and that was the Maplin I understand that was washed away in 1932 and the mucking flat which was further in towards London. Uh, the history of the Chapman, I've got a note here that says the demise of the Chapman was nearly a tragedy. Some years earlier a new oil jetty was built upstream which altered the tidal flow and the mud flaps, mud flats were slowly eroded without being noticed. One day the PK reported that the relief boat coming alongside with a bump made a ringing sound. 
Urgent investigation, investigation found the outside leg was just hanging in, in a hole. A panic evacuation and then demolition. And I had this information from Mike Tarrant on the 16th of the 9th, 1991. So I'm much obliged to you, Mike, if ever you see this. Uh, from the Chapman, I went back to the workshops, training depot, Blackwall. And did a bit of tin bashing, carpentry. Uh, had to learn the Morse code. Uh, things like this we made. <coughs> This is uh, one of my prized possessions. Cigarette lighter, form of a lighthouse. <laughs> Take the top off, and there's the lighter. That comes out. Top goes back on again. Where did you make that? This was made in the Blackball workshops also made a small cash box which I've still got and a very handsome wooden cutlery box uh, this has got a half penny rebated into it with the date 1950 the instructor you very rarely saw eventually turned up and says can you do all this kind of stuff I said yeah no problem know the Morse code? I says yeah didn't even want to test me on it he said fine that's it then so the next station I went to was another cushy number North Foreland uh, again a two man station living there with the families quite a nice place electric light no hood burners simple thing I see from this little scrapbook I was there from the 14th of September 49 to the 26th of October 49 nice little place this this is on the northeast tip of Kent between Ramsgate and Margate one mile north of Broadstairs had a radio beacon transmitting every six minutes and uh, luckily enough there were still customers coming turning up to have a look over the place to my astonishment after learning a bit of spiel on the way out they would insist on giving me money <laughs> yes right from there back to uh, Salmon Lane in the Missions to Seamen Hotel and then start in earnest on the big stuff which turned out to be Flamborough Head in 1949 November funny station Flamborough Head the fog signal station is quite a distance from the actual lighthouse uh, it's getting towards winter then as well. There were two of us SAKs on duty there at one particular time. And uh, the PK was a fella called Mundy. He was one of the old school. He really was thorough. Talk about brass cleaning, step cleaning everything had to be spotless luckily I was forewarned about his habit with a new SAK turning up that when it came to lens cleaning as you went round all the prisms you might find a matchstick on the top of one of them now if this is an old story I'll show you it's perfectly true there but sure enough one day I found this matchstick on one of the prism tops. The thing to do is just to 
just to bend it like that and leave it where it was. Never appeared again. Um, this is where I first learned all there was to know about Hornsby engines down in the fog signal station. I've always been interested in engines of all sorts and these were real engines. Uh, if the old man was a bit of a stickler for discipline and cleanliness and lots and lots of bull, he was also an expert with his engine and I had a thorough grounding in the operation of these things. The only problem there, because the fog station was way down on the cliff front, away from the lighthouse, and you was on watch in the actual lighthouse, and it started to become foggy, you couldn't really tell whether it was bad enough to get on the telephone and wake the bloke up down at the fog signal station. If you woke him up and he came out and thought, it's not really foggy enough, then you got a bit of a rocket off him. On the other hand, if it was foggy enough and the skipper woke up, looked out of his bedroom window, you got a rocket off him. So actually it was, as the Americans would say, between a rock and a hard place when it was foggy. Uh, Flambra was one station I don't really think I would have like to have been appointed to somehow, uh, married or not. The other SAK's name was Eric Elliott. And I've got a photograph of him leaning out of the top of the tower, high in the clouds it says. Good photograph of part of the lens. Um, another thing there was you had to go out onto the gallery, the top of the tower in when it was snowing about every 10 minutes and brush the snow off off the glazing otherwise it had stopped the light shining through uh, so when I left there and I got home I all backs of my hands were chucked to glory I know that for a fact uh, right so from Flambra hmm went home on leave for a bit uh, and then let's have a look I have to do this it's 49 years ago so I've got to look through this to see where we went to next the next one was an interesting lighthouse the Smalls Small Tower Rock I didn't mind it at all there, really. It's all right if you get on okay with your mates, as long as you don't gamble and uh, argue about religion and politics, you get on okay. So that was the next one, the Smalls. I was there from the 14th of March to the 11th of May 1950, and I served there again on relief as SAK it was interesting the second time because after the two months were up as you know we did two month spells then not month and month about two months on month is sure uh, the bloke who should have relieved me had gone sick and I had a message come through from CG Hollyhead would I mind doing an extra month oh. Of the month. Time drags a bit but nevertheless looking back on it time really flies so yes I did the extra month so I was, I was actually on this one the second time for three months. Nice few photographs here all right of the smalls. Uh, later I was to be appointed to assistant keeper that was in early 1951. What did they have on the station for the light and engines and stuff? No engines on the smalls. Um, 
it had a the light was a revolving triple flashing lenticular apparatus turning at four revolutions per minute visibility 17 miles also a subsidiary light showing red and 19 feet below the main light this shone over the hats and barrels rock this was fixed of course uh, the main light was a 75 millimeter hood burner the subsidiary light was a 50 millimeter hood burner and the revolving main lens of course was operated in the old-fashioned way by a hand wound weight driven clock the light gave out 477,000 candle power so you have to wind the clock up and keep pumping up the small pressure tanks especially on so uh, how often did you wind up can you remember uh, about every hour yeah. if you forgot as the weights came down they triggered another triggered a bell just to remind you one place you didn't dare doze off at um, the fog signal was interesting this was uh, an explosive fog signal um, I think if I'm correct it was up, it went bang with a couple of two ounce tonite charges so what you had to do when it was foggy was turn a wheel which lowered the jib that hung above the top of the lantern then you went out onto the gallery and connected two two ounce tonite charges to the arms of this jib went back inside the lantern turned this wheel whereby the jib went sailing upwards and you connected up the electrical connectors because the two ounce tonite charges had a detonator in them and then you wound up a clock which rang every five minutes so when it rang you pushed the plunger and bang went the explosive charge now before you did this one of the precautions was that you went down into the kitchen and drew the coal fire that had to be put out uh, it put covers everywhere all around the room dust covers because the first time the tonite charge went off the concussion swept the chimney in which case <laughs> the kitchen got covered in soot wasn't too bad after that of course anybody trying to sleep uh, you know night through this with a report going off every five minutes you'd have to be dead uh, <laughs> It was an interesting station. You, you could get off it and low water. You could walk about on the landings and the rocks. Uh, one of the fellas that I was on with was a bloke called Clements, Jeff Clements. The fella in charge was a Ron Bevan. I noticed that uh, later on, in uh, December the 2nd, 1984, a keeper was sacked protesting that the Smalls Lighthouse, the most remote in Britain, had no lavatory. John Clark, 32, used to have to climb to the lantern and use a bucket, then throw the contents over the side. Also, there was only a plastic bowl to wash in on the lighthouse, 20 miles, 21 miles off the Pembrokeshire coast, and he refused to work there after nearly a year of complaints. He was dismissed by his employers, Trinity House, following a disciplinary hearing. He's claiming unfair dismissal. And this went on in October 1985. He got to £1,800 con compensation for this, mm -hmm. for being wrongfully dismissed. <laughs> An industrial tribunal in Cardiff upheld a complaint by John Clark that there was no bath, shower or flushing toilet. Well, actually there was a toilet in the smalls. 
way down in the bowels of the building, if you'll excuse the pun, looking like a refugee from a medieval dungeon. We never use it, of course. There's nothing wrong with the Elson and the bucket. A nice big bowl of water to strip off in the lower light room. Have a good wash down. No problem. When it comes to emptying the bucket, if it was a nice day and one's mates were walking about on the landing stretching their legs, it was considered to polite to go out onto the gallery and give them a whistle and the sight of the outstretched bucket would uh, ensure that they got out the road before you emptied the contents <laughs> over the side because due to wind eddies there was no sort of impact point that you could rely on. Yes, I didn't mind this place at all, the smalls, better than the wolf, other places like that. So anyway, some nice photographs of it, happy days. So anyway, it was shifting around again, and then finally I went to the, the coke it was next. Nice place to coke it. And then on to the long stone. And then back down the coast of Wales to the uh, to Bardsey. Followed by South Bishop. Followed by Smalls appointed. And uh, yes, and then f on to um, Skokum. In the meantime, had a spell at uh, the Skerries. Where was that place you were telling me where the other keepers played pranks with the empty in the bucket? Oh yeah, empty in the toilet bucket on uh, South Bishop, yes, when I was there as an AK and they went on home on relief, it would find when it was your turn to empty the toilet bucket, they chucked half a dozen bricks in it to make it heavy, you see, because you have to <laughs> cart this thing to the cliff somewhere and chuck it over the side, so that was a sort of the earthy humour they had and this fella Graham Fern I'm sure I followed him round on various lighthouses uh, he denies it of course but I know I did same as he denies pinching some of my uh, articles written for inclusion in LAMP which he also denies I read his articles in LAMP sometimes and I have to screw mine up and throw them away <laughs> The Longstone was interesting, Grace Darling and all that business of course, um, nothing much on towards happened there, could catch lobsters at low tide, and it was interesting when the terns were nesting, if he was interested in anything like that. Uh, actually the, uh, <coughs> the lantern, the actual lens, was a, a mechanical one. It didn't float in a, a bath of mercury. It was purely mechanical and it had a nasty habit of keep stopping. So eventually it was taken out and it was returned back to almost where it was made in the Museum of Science and Industry in Newall Street, which is not far from where I live, of course. I went down there to see it one day and found this thing revolving in the wrong direction. Uh, could have been altered I suppose by turning some wires in opposite directions or something. But perhaps it just went better that way, nobody seemed interested. And uh, I've got a friend who's uh, the museum's gun expert and he told me that uh, they had to fit a brass shear pin 
somewhere in the cogs. Uh, this was to avoid damage by certain members of the public who had the habit of uh, putting coins on the track and doing damage. Yes. Did you have a favourite station? Yes, unfortunately uh, I did. And that came later in uh, my service career, which was Skokum. I mean, that would have been anybody's favourite station. The Kokit was nice. Uh, they had a small sailing dinghy with a drop centre board and you could spin for mackerel and I suppose there's lots of stories about the Kokit. We had, uh, while well, I was there as uh, an a uh, SAK, they had a couple of goats, uh, British Sane and Goats, a Billy and a Nanny, which are expecting a kid. And uh, the regular keepers had reared these things from being very, very small. And uh, the Billy Goat, they used to nurse as a kitten, used to get in your lap. Trouble was when it grew up the size of a large Alsatian dog, it uh, didn't seem to be able to break the habit, and it still tried to get on your lap. But uh, I was on watch the one night, and uh, the uh, nanny goat having the uh, the kid had a lot of trouble. I didn't know what to do. I got the other blokes up; they didn't know what to do. They sent for a vet. Too late by the time he came. Um, the kid was stillborn and the goat died unfortunately and I had to dig a hole outside and uh, bury her in it. Shame about that. I uh, don't know what happened after that, whether they kept kids. Nice photograph here of me, Harry Fenn and Jimmy Wood who were the keepers with the spaniel dog who was a good rabbiter. He didn't need a gun on there to shoot rabbits, he'd tell you where they were. That was one little disaster on the, on the Kokit. We keep hearing tales that Kokit was uh, haunted, is that true? Oh yes, uh, so I was led to believe and I must admit, you know, I've been uh, in the army, I was considered something of a tougher, but I'd actually been in the commandos, but uh, there were places there that I wouldn't go because it was built on the site of a, an old m monastery or something hundreds and hundreds of years ago. It wasn't too bad there. The fog signal there was an explosive report every three minutes. Same as the s'mores. Um, but we didn't have any fog. Uh, when was this? The 6th of July till the 3rd of August 1950. And there were masses and masses of uh, wild strawberries on the station. So with a lot of strawberries and a lot of fish to eat if you fancied it we didn't do too bad there uh, rather poignant story here because um, during my stay in London uh, at Salmon Lane and going to the different stations and then going back there and back to Blackwall I uh, got friendly with a, a Trinity House electrician a young folk fellow by the name of Jock Cor. His family had got a flat at Eltham and he invited me there one weekend which made a nice change mm -hmm. and uh, not long ago I was looking through one of the copies of the newsletter Lamp and there was a mention of him about a propeller 
on a generator somewhere south Foreland uh, shaking they didn't have much um, luck with it the same as the propeller on top of the tower of the smalls which you couldn't operate in anything more than a gentle breeze because it would shake the tower uh, so I was friendly with Jock and of course 40 odd years later looking through this scrapbook and got a photograph of him so I eventually contacted him he was living at Kings Lynn had a nice letter from him giving me a history of his family and what, what he was done and all that uh, so I sent him this photograph and he thanked me for it and then unfortunately just a few weeks later he, he died most poignant it just shows you Mm, shame. Uh, from the Longstone, spot more leaves, spot more training, and then uh, across to Wales, and the spell on the Skerries. Um, well, let's pick it up. drawing of the scaries. Now the scaries is really a massive station or oh, was wow. and uh, I enjoyed it there according to the scrapbook here 27th of September to the 24th of October 1950 now this was really a, a big place and uh, it didn't have hood burners and no compressed paraffin or anything like that to get cracking fully electric very very nice uh, several rabbits on the scaries throwbacks from when families living on there I suppose had rabbits pet rabbits and they become feral rabbits so different colored quite an interesting station uh, I've actually got in the cabinet there a, a model of it made by a chap who advertises them in Hollywood. And then from the Skerries down to Bardsey, another nice place, quite big again. This was from the 25th of October to the 22nd of November 1950. Uh, farm on Bardsey, you could go and get eggs, fresh milk. Quite a nice billet this was. And plenty of room to move about. Bardsey to South Bishop uh, did a spell there yeah. I did a month with the two keepers who then went on um, on leave leaving me an SAK with a month's knowledge of the place uh, the relief another keeper came on who'd been appointed there hadn't got a clue he d didn't know anything about Hornsby engines and another SAK likewise so I suddenly found myself as an SAK trying to train these other two in the use of Hornsby engines so this is where Skipper Mundy's thorough grounding in Hornsby engines came in very very useful um, especially during the reliefs because uh, you had to have, be a dab hand on the on the levers when it came to uh, getting the stores aboard That's 
Because it was brought on by uh, like a winch, and oh yeah, um, winch operated hoist. You couldn't see the hook when you sent it out because it went out so far and then down the cliff out of sight to the cutting at the bottom of the cliff where the launch was bobbing up and down six eight nine feet depending on the weather it's quite complicated really because I had the job of actually being in the winch room twiddling the levers there'd be a chap standing on the edge of the gantry uh, his job was to unhook the gear as it came onto the gantry and also relay signals from the other keeper who was standing on the top of the cliff acting as banksman uh, so a crafty keeper knowing wanting to know where the whereabouts of the hook was when it was out of sight would paint the horses on the drum with paint so he could look at it and it'd give him an indication of where the hook was in relation to where the launch was bobbing up and down so once you got the hang of it it wasn't much of a problem um, Of course it's a lot different now. I've got several drawings of uh, the South Bishop in December 1950 and also a superb modern photograph of the same station uh, since automation. Uh, a lot of it's altered of course. South Bishop was down to the Smalls again. Oh, I got appointed to the Smalls. So I knew my way around that all right. So fair enough. No problem. And then later, of course, joy of joys, or doing something terribly wrong, depending on your point of view, was appointed to Skokum. A butlins of a place was that. Very nice on Skokum. Sort of place that a uh, bit of company in the summer, because Peter Scott and his friends, or nowadays the bird watchers I suppose still go off there for years I wanted a photograph of Skokum and eventually got some now some real beauts uh, Got a note here on a Trinity House wireless telephone service message. Skokum Lighthouse Christmas 1951. Christmas dinner was duck and green peas, cream potatoes, roast potatoes, carrots, swede, baked beans, onions, gravy, Christmas pudding and custard. Beer and cigars would you believe? And for tea 5.30 we had bread and butter, tin peaches, jelly, Christmas cake, chocolate sponge cake, chocolate sponge sandwich and tea. Um, I was always interested in shooting and uh, I don't suppose the elder brethren of Trinity House would have appreciated the fact that I had a small bore cartridge rifle off there. It was legal and had it on a firearm certificate it was very very handy for shooting the rabbits because the dog had a rabbit every day for its dinner so I learned how to gut skin cook rabbits and I 
I stalked a pair of ducks on the lake on Skokum and uh, eventually managed to shoot a duck so we actually had uh, roast duck and that's where the duck and green peas came from for dinner. <laughs> Funny thing about uh, Skokum, some distance away from the landing of course, and uh, I suppose you know the history of hooking up this wheeled truck that ran on, way on a railway track from the landing up to the lighthouse, hauled by a horse called Prince. There are plenty of stories about Prince. Um, the main story about him, which is going back into folklore, more or less, is that when the Argus or the Patricia, or one of the Trinity houseboats was due on the relief, you had to put the flag up. And when Prince spotted the flag going up, he'd disappear, because he knew what was happening, you see. Some work to do, and uh, he had a job to find him. But eventually crafty keepers used to find him first and hobble him so he didn't go too far. And this is what you did. As far as I can remember this truck being subject to gravity would free wheel by itself down to the landing at speeds depending on how good your nerves were. And uh, you loaded up the truck with your stores, hooked up prints told him to get cracking. Of course it was slightly uphill and every so often he'd stop for a breather, in which case there'd be somebody there with a block of wood to quickly jam it under the back wheels. I understand that uh, he became redundant eventually and uh, this four-wheel truck and the horse were dispensed with and uh, there was some kind of a mechanical vehicle that uh, did the job instead. I uh, read that somewhere in one issue of LAMP so anybody interested could, could look back through that. Uh, so I was quite pleased with this appointment to um, Skokum. Um, I've got a little note here on the 20th of December 1951 that 92 mile an hour winds were recorded at, recorded at St Anne's Head on the Pembrokeshire coast at 11am and the extract from the journal on the weather conditions at Skokum which was three miles from St Anne's was at 1200 hours wind direction west force 10 which is a whole gale so you'd have a job to stand up on that. Another little recollection about Prince the, the horse was occasionally he'd uh, stick his head over the perimeter wall on the scrounge for crusts of bread and we had a young uh, SAK come off there who was an ex Bernardo's boy I think and, and very sympathetic towards animals and of course Prince was soaking wet living outside all the time he was used to it uh, so this lad decided to go outside and give Prince a rub down with some old sacking and promptly got kicked for his Pains, cause I don't know whether Prince thought he was taking liberties with him or not, but a right old bruise on his leg, so <laughs> he couldn't take liberties with Prince. Uh, quite liked it at Skokum, but unfortunately I got hit with one of Cupid's arrows. Uh, and my young lady didn't fancy the idea of me spending two months on the station and a month ashore so regretfully and I regret this now and I will do to my dying day 
I had to terminate my employment with Trinity House. Um, getting back to the smalls, the small tower rock, things like the wolf, um, one irritating thing that would happen uh, during r real rough weather at night is you get these big rollers coming in, big waves, that would smash against the building and make it shake. So what was a bit of a bind was that um, when the wave hit the tower it would shake and on top of the hood burner would be a carrier with a mantle on it which became incandescent when you put it onto the burner so when it's incandescent it becomes rigid and brittle and the shaking of the tower would fracture it so what you did then was you picked up another carrier with a, a mantle already attached and take the ruptured carrier and mantle off the top of the hood burner with a pair of tongs and put another one on so you couldn't stay away from the uh, lantern or from inside the lens much more than two or three minutes getting back to these uh, these hood burns with the uh, incandescent mantles of course they were operated by vaporized paraffin it's exactly the same way as a primer stove or a tilly lamp and um, the power for vaporizing this was compressed air contained in a in a tank which had a handle on and a pressure gauge and of course you had to pump this thing up every hour uh, and you could just about manage a hundred strokes before you stop for a breather and uh, heaven help you if you didn't pump it up and wind the clock up for the revolving lens mechanism before you called your mate to take over. So if you were sounding for fog at night oh. you, you had the, the explosives to do the S light then? Yeah, sounding for fog at night you was kept quite busy really and uh, pumping up the uh, pressure tank um, looking after both the lights and sounding for fog I mean time really flew so you're pleased to hand over the watch then yeah you was pleased to hang on to oh in the meantime of course you had to make sure that uh, there was some hot water somehow somehow because when your mate came on the first thing he wanted was a cuppa <laughs> Right, I'd like to thank you for all your, your trouble. And yeah. Wish you well. Well, thank you as well. I'm, I hope that uh, all this comes in handy in years to come. <laughs>